Well, this morning, uh, we are starting a sermon series through the book of 1 Kings. And unfortunately, since my time is limited with you, we will not be able to cover the entire book. In fact, we're actually going to start in chapter 12. So, have a little head start here. But our sermon text this morning will be 1 Kings chapter 12. And we'll read verses 1 through 24. So again, that's 1 Kings 12, 1 through 24. Pay careful attention, for this is the word of God. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon... Then Jeroboam returned from Egypt, and they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, Go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day. As the king said, come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly, and forsaking the the counsel that the old men had given him, he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion do we have in David? We had no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariots to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. When Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the the man of God, Say to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up or fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. 
every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and went home again according to the word of the Lord. Well, thus ends the reading of God's word. Let us now pray and ask for God's help. O oh Lord, open our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit, so that as the, the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Well, one of the best things, I think, about starting a new internship is not only the time that I get to spend in God's Word, but it's also the time I get to spend with you, getting to know you. So you see, my job is not merely to proclaim the text of Scripture, but it's to proclaim it to you. And therefore, I must get to know not only the text, but also I must get to know you. And since I haven't had much of an opportunity to get to know you yet, I decided to do some research of my own. And so I took to the internet, which we all know is highly reliable, and um, I wanted to get a feeling for this place of Torrance, which you call home. So the, these are just a few of the, the headlines this week from Torrance and the surrounding areas. I'll, I'll just read three of them. So, second bus carrying migrants from Texas arrives to Los Angeles. Second, Massive fire breaks out at discount store in South Central Los Angeles. Or here's the third one. Report, homeless population rises 9% in Los Angeles County. Now, I'm sure this is a lovely place to live, <laughs> but these headlines remind us that we are not living yet under the full expression of the righteous reign of Christ. Jesus has not yet vanquished unrighteousness from the earth. And when you look around this city, this nation, even this world, you may wonder, will that day of righteousness and justice ever come? If Jesus will ever return, Will he ever establish peace and prosperity once and for all? Well, brothers and sisters, this was the predicament of 1 Kings 12. You see, the Davidic dynasty had already been established in which God promised David that his son would reign on his throne forever. Now, this son would be a righteous king who would establish peace and justice on the earth. His reign would, was said to cause the nations to flock to Israel to worship the God of Israel. And while David's son Solomon showed a lot of promise in the beginning, he ended quite poorly, marrying many foreign women in disobedience to God's law, and even worshiping other gods. Solomon was not the righteous son of David that we've all been waiting for. And in our text today, David's grandson, Rehoboam, he's not even close to the righteous Davidic king that Israel had hoped for. In fact, as I will soon show you, Rehoboam had more in common with the Pharaoh of Egypt than he did with his righteous grandfather, David. This corruption, oppression, and foolishness of this Davidic king makes all of God's promises seem like a hopeful wish like a utopian thought that God gave to comfort us but had no intention of actually doing. And while the author of Kings shows that Israel is far from the experience of God's promise, 
Nevertheless, he also shows us that God's promises do not depend upon our compliance. God will fulfill his word, even when we foolishly rebel against his wisdom. His word is true. And when times seem uncertain, his promises are sure. And as surely as his word was fulfilled in 1 Kings 12, so he will fulfill his word to us. So to see God's faithfulness in this dark time, we will approach our text in three points. First, we'll see another Egypt. Second, another engagement with Pharaoh. And third, another exodus. So let us begin by looking at our first point, another Egypt. Well, God's people, they are far from experiencing the promise of God that a righteous son of David would rule over them. In fact, the land of Egypt or the land of Israel, it's almost unrecognizable from the promised land that David had ruled over. It operates and feels much more like the land of Egypt. The first clue that we are metaphorically back in Egypt is that the Israelites are enslaved to a new pharaoh-like king. Now we get our first hint that Rehoboam is more like the wicked pharaoh of Egypt than he is like his righteous grandfather when he goes to Shechem to become king. Now, Shechem plays a rather insignificant role in David and Solomon's kingdom. So this is a very strange place to be crowned king. But in the book of Judges, there was another man who was crowned king in Shechem, and it was the wicked king Abimelech. And in Judges 9, we see that this man, who is supposed to be a judge of Israel, He was supposed to deliver Israel. He, in fact, ended up inflicting Israel. It did not go well for Israel the last time a man was crowned king in Shechem. This this setting is meant to make us suspicious of this man, Rehoboam we are led to think that perhaps he will be a wicked king like Pharaoh or Abimelech. But we get an even more explicit allusion to Egypt with the language of slavery in verse 4. Look with me at verse 4. This is Jeroboam speaking on behalf of Israel, and he says, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. The Israelites are not experiencing God's prosperity under this Davidic king, but they complain about their hard service. And verse 18 makes it clear that this was actually forced labor. They also cry out in distress about their heavy yoke. They have been taxed so much that they cannot make ends meet. In other words, their their labor, it's, it's basically unpaid. Through these high taxes, the king takes back almost everything that they had earned. So the Israelites are are forced laborers who are virtually unpaid. In other words, they're, they're slaves. And so we see the Israelites are enslaved to a new Pharaoh like king, crowned in the same place as wicked Abimelech. But the second way that we see that they are metaphorically back in Egypt is that. uh, There is not only a new pharaoh in town, but God has also raised up a new Moses. So if Rehoboam is a new pharaoh, Jeroboam is a new Moses figure. 
Our text hints at this in verse 2. Notice that verse 2 says that when Jeroboam heard that Rehoboam was about to be crowned king, he was in Egypt where he had fled from Solomon. Now this is referencing back to chapter 11, which we unfortunately had to skip. But in chapter 11, the word of the Lord came in a hopeless time. And because Solomon's heart was torn away from God as he worshipped these other gods, the prophet Ahijah said that God would tear the ten northern tribes of Israel from David's house. These tribes would be given to Jeroboam. And God promised Jeroboam that if he followed God's commands and walked in his ways, God would establish his throne just as he did with David's. And so Jeroboam is set up as this Moses-like figure. He will deliver Israel from Pharaoh's oppression according to God's word. And just like Moses tried to take justice into his own hands and he killed an Egyptian and then fled, so did Jeroboam prematurely attempt to deliver God's people. 1 Kings 11.26 says that Jeroboam lifted up his hand against King Solomon. And when it didn't work, 1 Kings 11.40 says that Jeroboam fled into Egypt until the death of Solomon. And so here we are, we're back in this metaphorical Egypt. Israel is enslaved to Pharaoh, and the one that God has called to deliver his people, well, he's out hiding in the wilderness. But when Solomon dies, and Rehoboam goes to Shechem, well, everything changes Now, God's deliverer comes out of hiding to face Pharaoh. And at this time, we move into our second point, another engagement with Pharaoh. Well, led by Jeroboam, the Israelites go before Rehoboam, and they demand their freedom. Moses said, let my people go. And Jeroboam says, Lighten our hard service and our heavy yoke. In true Moses-like fashion, Jeroboam demands for God's people to be released from slavery so that they might be full citizens of God's kingdom. Now, Jeroboam is not demanding a physical release out of the land, but simply a change of status. Pharaoh needs to release them from their status of slavery so that Jeroboam could lead them into this new metaphorical land as citizens of God's kingdom. If Rehoboam will oblige their request, they will serve him as citizens. But the demand for freedom was met with a display of egotism. We see Rehoboam's egotism and narcissism in his interaction with his counselors. He first sought counsel with the old men or elders. And look with me at verse 6 when the author of Kings describes these elders. It says, Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive. These men had stood before Solomon, the wisest man on earth. And Solomon, and in the tradition after him, explained why they kept these men in his company. In Proverbs 13.20, he wrote, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So Solomon kept these men around because he wanted to walk with the wise so that he might exercise wisdom. 
And just as they surely shared wisdom with Solomon, so now they wisely advised Rehoboam. And look with me at their advice in verse 7. They said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. So notice the wisdom behind their counsel. If Rehoboam becomes their servant for one day, they will be his servants forever. If he gives them what they want, if he speaks good words to them, then they will be loyal to him. But notice the strong language that the author of Kings uses in verse 8. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. He abandoned counsel. He abandoned wisdom. Instead of listening to the gray-haired men who had proven themselves as wise advisors, He turned to the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And do you remember what what Solomon had to say about his son's friends? Remember back to Proverbs 13, 20. He said of his own friends, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. This is what Solomon said of his son's friends. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. They're foolish. And Rehoboam will suffer harm by associating with them. And that's precisely what happens. Look at their foolish advice in verses 10 and 11. They advise Solomon to tell the people, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Now this language his friends use here, it's entirely inappropriate and vain. The ESV translates it as my little finger, but the Hebrew, it actually just says my little, and it expects us to supply the word thing. So like my little thing. And the reference to his father's thighs, well, it's almost certainly a a euphemism for a particular male organ. So without getting too graphic here, Rehoboam is saying that he is bigger, he is tougher, he is more manly than his father. And if his father disciplined with whips, well, he will discipline them with scorpions. Now, this is probably not that eight-legged creature that you try to avoid out in the wild. Rather, it's a specific uh, tip of the, the whip that was designed for harsh and cruel punishment. So these young men advised Rehoboam to increase their forced labor and taxes. They thought Rehoboam needed to show the people that he was greater and stronger than his father. And the fact that these people were Rehoboam's friends greatly reveals the kind of person Rehoboam was. Arrogant and selfish. He had no honor for his father. He had no regard for wisdom. And Rehoboam's display of egotism resulted in a deliberate expansion of Israel's affliction. He foolishly took the young men's advice. Just like Pharaoh made the Hebrew slaves work harder after Moses said, let my people go. So now this new Israelite Pharaoh on David's throne increases their heavy load. And in this moment of abusive, 
exploitative power, the author of Kings gives us a heavenly interpretation of this horrific evil. Look with me at verse 15. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. We have seen in the narrative so far that that Rehoboam was foolish and and had a sinful heart. He he had abandoned wisdom of his own free will. And yet, verse 15 says that it was brought about by the Lord. So which is it? Did Rehoboam act foolishly of his own free will? Or did God bring about this foolishness? The answer, of course, is yes. It's the exact same thing that we we see in the Exodus narrative. Did Pharaoh harden his own heart? Or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Again, the answer is yes. Both God and Rehoboam intended for the people's request to be ignored. But notice the different purposes. Rehoboam ignored the people out of his own foolishness and sin. But God providentially brought about the rejection of the people's request so that his word would be fulfilled. So that the kingdom might be torn from Solomon and Rehoboam. So that Israel might be delivered. Well, we have heard a lot of words so far. We've heard the words of the people that the king ignored. We've heard the words of the old men that the king abandoned. We've heard the words of the young men that the king foolishly listened to, and it resulted in a disaster. And in every one of these cases, the words failed. But notice that there is a word that cannot fail. God's word. Even wicked men like Pharaoh and Rehoboam end up unwittedly following, fulfilling God's word. Men can try to ignore it, but it cannot ultimately be ignored. God's word will stand. His promises will be fulfilled. And even though Israel is in another Egypt, facing another Pharaoh, nevertheless, according to God's word, there will be another exodus. The kingdom will be torn. It will be divided. And Jeroboam will bring the ten northern tribes out from Pharaoh's wicked oppression. So now let us briefly turn to our last point, another exodus. Well, just like in the book of Exodus, Rehoboam tried to control God's people to increase their work, but it backfired. Whereas the Pharaoh of Egypt faced the judgment of God in terms of plagues, the Pharaoh of Israel faced the judgment of God through the angry rebellion of the people. The people gathered together and declared their independence. They had no portion in David, no inheritance in the son of Jesse. They were not of David's house anymore. And as we are nearing the 4th of July... We remember that a declaration of independence is usually followed by a long struggle and war. And just as we would expect, Rehoboam, he did not honor their secession from the kingdom. He tried to enforce his stricter oppression on on Israel by, by sending to them a taskmaster. 
But this just proved to be an, uh, another unwise decision, and the people of Israel stoned Adoram to death. And just like the Exodus account, the Pharaoh over Egypt gathered together a large number of chosen warriors to fight against the house of Israel, to restore the kingdom. And we know how God stopped the Egyptian army. He swallowed them up in the Red Sea. But how will God stop Rehoboam's army from attacking? What great demonstration of power would God use? Well, in verse 24, we see that God used a power even mightier than the waters of the Red Sea. He stopped the army with his word. Look with me at this word of God spoken by his prophet in verse 24. Thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. Every man return to his home, for this thing is from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and went home again according to the word of the Lord. Now this might seem anticlimactic to you, but it is far from it. Here we see the only word in the entire story with truthfulness and power to accompany it. Rehoboam can't even control his own people with his words. Israel's words of declaration seem virtually ignored by Rehoboam. His counselor's words failed, but God's word stops an army in its tracks. God's word makes a foolish and power-hungry king retreat from the battlefield. God's word leads slaves out of oppression without a war. Behold the new exodus. Pharaoh has been stripped of his slaves because of God's word. Israel has been rescued from their slavery because of God's word. And Jeroboam will soon be established as king according to God's word. Brothers and sisters, we have seen today in our text that God's word is powerful. It is always fulfilled. And that should cause us to tremble today. Because God's word says that by nature, we are his enemies. Like Rehoboam, we have abandoned the wisdom of God's law and foolishly listened to worldly counsel. We are so much like Rehoboam, selfish and proud, dishonoring our parents to make ourselves look better, preferring control over charity, authority over affection. In our failure to love one another, we have failed to love God whose image we bear. And as a result, God's powerful word stands against us and promises our judgment. And his promises always come true. We begin by wondering if Jesus will ever return and and end the unrighteousness in this world. Well, he promises to do so, and you are part of the unrighteous world that he's promised to destroy. And so when we hear that God's word is always fulfilled, if you have any awareness of yourself and your sin at all, you tremble. But there is good news today. Because God has not only promised the judgment of the unrighteous, 
but he has also promised the justification of the unrighteous. You see, God has kept his word to David. David's greater son, Jesus the Messiah, has come. And he did not come of his own will, following the foolish counsel of the world, but he came to accomplish the will of the Father, saying, not my will, but yours be done. Rehoboam dishonored his father. Jesus supremely honored his heavenly father, saying, the father is greater than I. Rehoboam loved himself and oppressed God's people. But Jesus loved God's people such that he faced oppression for them. Jesus, the son of David, has perfectly loved God and his neighbor as himself. He obeyed God unto death, even death on a cross. And because he obeyed as the last Adam, as our covenant head, he obeyed on our behalf. Therefore, God's unchanging and powerful word, which declared Christ righteous, has also declared us righteous. For all of those who have faith in Jesus, God's unshakable promises are now for your good. They declare God's everlasting love for you. They declare that nothing will separate you from his love. They declare that God will never leave you or forsake you. That he will always be with you unto the end of the age. They declare that Jesus will return for you. And he will judge all the wicked. And you will live under his righteous reign forever. There will be no crime section in the new creation newspaper. You will only read of his love and faithfulness forever. Brothers and sisters, just as surely as God fulfilled his word and split the kingdom into two, so you can be assured that Jesus will fulfill his word and return for you and bring the consummation of his kingdom of righteousness with him. The wicked will be judged, and all of God's people will live with Christ in love and peace forever. So let us cling to God's word today, and trust that he will fulfill all his good promises that he has spoken to us in Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you humbled today as we see our sin in Rehoboam, despising wisdom, dishonoring parents, a craving for power and control. Lord, it is no wonder that your word stands against us in our natural state. But God, you have given us your spirit and you have united us to Christ by faith. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that your unshakable promises of salvation are spoken over us. Give us faith to trust in your Son, even as the world rebels against him. And assure us of our heavenly hope by your Spirit. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.